Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. An independent panel is proposing big changes in military benefits from earlier retirements to 401k style pensions. Today's report also calls for improving compensation systems and a wider menu of health plans for military families, along with better access to child care and other support for families. Current service members could keep their existing benefits. The report says the changes would save more than $20 billion over the next four years. President Obama says he will review it. Today, the city of San Diego got its first legal place to buy medical marijuana. The Planning Commission unanimously approved a cooperative in Otay Mesa, but it still has one more step to go. KPBS Metro reporter Taryn Mento shows us how it works. Hello, I'm Taryn Mento, Metro reporter for KPBS News. And today, we're talking about pot. To be exact, we're talking about medical marijuana consumer cooperatives. Californians approved the use of medical marijuana in 1996, and almost 20 years later, San Diego is finally making it happen. And this is how it works. To open a medical marijuana cooperative in San Diego, there's at least two things you need, a conditional use permit, or CUP, and a public safety permit. A CUP is needed for dozens of other projects, including daycares, liquor stores, and museums. Every CUP application, including for a medical marijuana cooperative, requires some basic documents. Proof of ownership, site plans, floor plans, but if you're a cooperative, there are few extras. Plans must include security cameras, alarms, and guards. Storefront signs can only be two colors, no graphics. And cooperatives can't be near certain places, such as schools, libraries, and daycare centers. Applicants have to prove this with a map that shows the types of facilities and zones that are within 1,000 feet of the proposed site. Eugene Davidovich, who walks clients through the process, explains how involved this can get. You actually have to send somebody on the ground to examine the businesses within a thousand foot area after you have identified a map of all of the surrounding businesses and with a checklist write down every business that is in every multi-tenant building around and identify that list on a spreadsheet and present it to the city. The map, spreadsheet and about a dozen other documents are dropped off for review at the city's development services department. The application undergoes four reviews, planning, engineering, environmental, and transportation. Edith Gutierrez, who oversees the city's cooperative permit process, explains what each division looks for. For example, the planner is looking for the distance requirements, making sure it meets the zone. Um, engineering is looking for um, ADA compliance, um, accessibility, um, driveways. Environmental is looking for you know a, um, environmental impacts and uh, transportation that it meets the parking requirements. This is when problems can arise. The applicant may understand medical marijuana consumer cooperative rules one way, while the city interprets them another way. Cooperatives must be 1,000 feet from a, quote, minor-oriented facility, but what that is is not exactly clear. And the number of required parking spaces is also up in the air. This creates a back and forth and applicants usually resubmit their paperwork before moving on to the final step. That's when the city recommends the conditional use permit be approved or denied. Either way, it goes to a hearing officer who holds a public meeting for input, then issues a final ruling. Even if the permit is granted at this point, someone can appeal the ruling to the Planning Commission. The Commission's decision is final. Step two is a public safety permit. It requires every cooperative employee be fingerprinted and background checked by the police department. The public safety permit must be renewed every year and the conditional use permit every five years. So that's the process. If you have any questions, which you probably do, tweet us at KPBS News with the hashtag pot permit. KPBS graphic artist Jorge Contreras helped produce that story. A little later on Evening Edition, we'll look at the legal arguments over how marijuana is classified and whether it should be considered the same as heroin and LSD. 95 measles cases are now traced to an outbreak at Disney theme parks, and health officials are keeping tabs on hundreds more potential patients. This week, Palm Desert High School told 66 students to stay home because they may have been exposed and haven't been vaccinated. 
Peggy Pico shows us how to find the vaccination rates right here in San Diego County. KPBS news partner iNewsource found out how many kindergartners in San Diego County are not vaccinated for measles, mumps, polio, and whooping cough. iNewsource reporter Joe Urardi and family medicine doctor Ellen Rodarte with Sharp Reese Steely Medical Center join us with the details. And Joe, using data from the State Department of Education and California Department of Public Health, you actually put together an interactive map showing the vaccination rates among kindergartners in San Diego County. Walk us through what you found. Sure, there's nearly 560 kindergartens, both private and public, in San Diego County. We put them on the map and then we join them with vaccination rates. So what you can see here are the green dots are the dots where the vaccination rate is above the county average of about 94%. Uh, the red dots are the ones where that vaccination rate is actually below that. So you can search by the name of the school, you can search by address, and you can actually filter by the vaccination rate, and then you can zoom in, and you can pick out any school you want. So let's just take this one totally at random, click on it right here, uh, the children's school, and you can see that their up-to-date students are about 92%, and they've got an 8% exemption rate. How do these rates compare to the previous year? So they're down slightly from the previous year in terms of the exemption rate. This year, it's about 7.6% of students aren't fully up to date with their vaccines. Last year, it was a little below 10%. However, those numbers are both more than they were a decade ago when the rate was below 6%. So Dr. Rodardi, so slightly more kids are vaccinated uh, these last couple of years. Uh, if that's true, why is the medical community uh, still concerned about vaccination rates? Well, we want all children vaccinated because we want to protect all the children from these diseases. And um, herd immunity is an issue for certain ones, but we want children to be immunized for things that aren't as uh, critical herd immunity wise. Hepatitis B, uh, uh, um, rubella, all these diseases, we want children immunized for all of them. And they're still serious illnesses. You can still Very have serious, a serious complications. Yeah. Uh, give us a few ideas of some of the things that can happen if you're not immunized and you get one of these infections. Right. When I have a family come in, in their mind, they think their child is healthy and they don't need these immunizations. In my mind and with my colleagues, we've seen these diseases. I've seen liver disease from hepatitis B. I've seen families devastated by congenital rubella. So anyone in medicine knows that these are real diseases that happen and affect families and affect their lives. So we want all of our children protected from them. And to, uh, you actually spoke to a woman who says uh, that she won't vaccinate her four-year-old son. Uh, let's see what she uh, told you. There are people out there who are going to be watching this, and when they hear you say these things, they're going to think she's a bad mother. She's endangering the life of her child. Or their child. Or their child. I've heard that one the most. What do you say to them? I just acknowledge myself for my choices. I don't say anything to them. If, if they are um, invested in their point of view, then that will be their point of view and I'm not going to defend mine or try to try to prove my point of view. It's just a choice that I, that I continue to make. So she's saying she's making this choice, she's not defending it. If you were to counsel a patient who had similar belief systems, what would you tell them? Well, first, I do anything I can to convince them to immunize their child. If I got on the floor on my hands and knees and that would get them to immunize their child, I'd do it. But if I can't, then I do remind them that they should not have that child travel. That child should not be around children under the age of one year. Because? because they can spread disease to children who don't have, whose families don't have the choice to be immunized. And those symptoms can manifest and be spread before the family realizes they have it. I see. Now, Joe, uh, you looked at data, this vaccination data, from both public and uh, private schools. Were there any trends or, or correlations that, that rose up when you were doing this? Yeah, there sure were, Peggy. So we 
looked at private versus public kindergartens and found that there was a noticeable increase at private kindergartens among students who took advantage of these personal belief exemptions and didn't vaccinate their kids versus public schools where the rate of personal belief exemptions were much lower. We also took a look just at public schools, comparing ones with high percentages of students who qualify for free or reduced meals to low percentages who qualify for free or reduced meals. And we saw a large disparity in terms of the schools with wealthier um, populations having higher rates of these personal belief exemptions. Okay. Uh, I news source Joe Girardi and Dr. Ellen Rodarte, thanks so much for the update. And I want to let folks know that uh, they can use your I news source interactive vaccine map just by going to kpbs.org. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. A judge says the state must choose a process to carry out the death penalty. This is not in order to resume executions, but California can no longer put off creating new rules for lethal injections. They've been on hold since 2012. Legal challenges could still delay executions here. A San Diego jury is now considering the fate of a man facing charges over running a revenge porn website. KPBS technology reporter David Wagner was at the courthouse for the closing arguments today. He joins us now to explain the case. So he's Kevin Bollert, and the case focuses on two websites he ran. The first was called YouGotPosted.com, and that's where witnesses say their private nude photos were posted without their permission. In many cases, ex-boyfriends uploaded these photos, which women shared expecting they'd stay secret. And it wasn't just the photos. These posts also included information about where the women lived, where they worked, their phone numbers, Facebook profiles. Victims told the jury about being harassed and having their reputation ruined as a result. The second website was called changemyreputation.com, and this is where victims went to pay Kevin Bollert hundreds of dollars to take down the photos. The defense admitted these websites were, quote, disgusting, hurtful, and immoral, but they argued that Bollert did not break the law simply by hosting a site where other people posted illegal content. So what's he being charged with, David? He's charged with conspiracy and multiple counts of identity theft and extortion. Now, he is not being charged under California's new law against revenge porn. That's because he didn't upload these photos himself. Other people did. Deputy Attorney General Tanya Austin countered by arguing that Bollert willfully obtained these photos and knowingly used them to threaten and extort victims. Let's hear from her now. His entire purpose of the site is shame and degradation to make money. Now, some men have already been convicted under California's revenge porn law for putting these kinds of photos online. But Kevin Bullard is one of the first website operators to face criminal charges. KPBS technology reporter David Wagner. State water managers measured the Sierra snowpack today, and they say it's way below normal. Just over seven inches of snow on the ground, only about a third of what there was a month ago. January has been very warm and dry. Forecasters say it might be one of the driest on record for Northern California. Professional hockey is returning to San Diego. The National Hockey League is moving five of its farm teams to California next year. Now here's a look at where the teams are going. San Diego will get the feeder team for the Anaheim Ducks. It's been known as the Norfolk Admirals based in Virginia. The new name won't be announced until next month. San Diego hasn't had pro hockey since 2006 when the goals went out of business. Just in time for the Super Bowl, Charger girls and other pro sports cheerleaders could get official employee status under a bill introduced today by San Diego Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez. It's prompted by lawsuits filed by former cheerleaders from other teams, including the Oakland Raiders. They say they worked unpaid overtime and got paid less than minimum wage. The bill would require sports teams to give cheerleaders the same rights and benefits as other employees. The University of San Diego predicts an upward trend for San Diego's economy. The school's index of leading economic indicators rose at the end of 2014 to its highest level in more than seven years. Researchers are predicting as many as 40,000 new jobs here this year. 
Governor Jerry Brown's getting record high approval ratings, 61 percent in a new poll out today, and state lawmakers got a 49 percent approval rating, their highest in more than a decade. Likely voters also support extending income and sales tax increases, and more than half of Californians believe racial disparities continue to persist. Trustees at the California State University System approved one fee while giving students a chance to get rid of another. The first is an optional $2 charge for the statewide student association. The other is a controversial student success fee. San Diego State and Cal State San Marcos both charge it to pay for things not covered by regular tuition. Trustees are giving the students the power to approve or rescind the fees, but the ones already in place cannot be canceled until 2021. A federal judge in Northern California is expected to rule later this year on whether marijuana should continue to be classified as a dangerous drug like LSD and heroin. Peggy Pico looks at the impact this case could have on U.S. drug policy. Since 1970, marijuana has been a Schedule I drug. It's a label the federal government gives to substances that are considered highly addictive with no recognized medical benefits. My guest, Alex Kreit, law professor at Thomas Jefferson School of Law, joins us with the potential impact of this ruling. And Alex, how unusual is it for a judge to re-examine the classification of marijuana? Yeah, this is really a surprising thing for the judge to be holding a hearing because the argument that the defendants in this case are making isn't that much different than an argument that a defense makes sort of with some routine across the country. Usually dis judges have been dismissing this argument out of hand that there's a constitutional problem with marijuana's classification federally. So for this judge to put aside five days to hold a hearing on it, that's a very unusual thing. What are some of the key arguments for and against reclassifying marijuana? Well, you know, the main argument I think that the defendants are making is that there's an equal protection problem. There's not a rational basis for classifying marijuana, the plant in Schedule 1, while Marinol, which is synthetic THC, which is one of the main constituent components of marijuana, is in Schedule 3. So they say, how could that be? How can the synthetic version be in Schedule 3, uh, a lower classification, while marijuana is in the heaviest schedule? Now, just this week, the American Academy of Pediatrics urged the federal government to downgrade, if you would, marijuana to a Schedule 2 drug. We're talking about natural occurring marijuana. What types of drugs are in Schedule 2 classification? Cocaine is in Schedule 2, for example. Really, Schedule 2, the difference between that and Schedule 1 is whether there's a currently accepted medical use or not. Um, as far as all the other uh, characteristics, the abuse potential, 1 and 2 are the same. It, the difference really is, does the federal government recognize that there's some medical use for it? If so, it would be moved to Schedule 2. Uh, isn't it difficult to do research on a Schedule 1 drug? Yeah, it's incredibly difficult to research a Schedule 1 drug because of all the administrative hurdles. Um, when something's in Schedule 1, from manufacture all the way down the line from distribution to the researcher, there's additional uh, hurdles that somebody has to go through if they want to research it. Now, a, a number of states have decriminalized, some have legalized marijuana, and there's a push here in California to get a legalized pot initiative on the 2016 ballot. What sort of impact would reclassifying marijuana have on the U.S. drug policy? Well, you know, I think more than anything, it would be another reason for Congress to look at it and step in and finally solve this problem. If marijuana were to be reclassified into the current system, it really wouldn't solve the conflict we have now between state and federal marijuana laws. It would maybe ameliorate it a little bit, but it wouldn't solve it. And one of the reasons for that, especially with recreational marijuana, as long as marijuana is scheduled, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, it can't be sold for recreation. Anything on those schedules could only be sold legally for medicine from Schedule 2 and on. So really, in order to ultimately solve the conflict, I think it's something that Congress is going to have to take up. Uh, there's a criminal case in Sacramento right now that we were talking about. When could we expect a decision on that? And how likely do you think it is that the drug, uh, that the, the judge will actually rule in favor of the defendants? I think that we're probably going to see a decision anywhere from the next couple of weeks to the next few months, depending on how much the judge wants to put into writing out the decision. I think it's unlikely that the judge is going to rule for the defendants uh, just simply because it is a tough constitutional argument to make. Regardless of what the logic might be from a policy basis, constitutionally, courts typically defer to Congress and to the executive in what they decide. So 
if it's within the realm of reason, courts are generally going to say, well, I might disagree, but that's not my call. So it's a tough argument to make. There's certainly some chance, but it, I would be surprised. So is reclassification and the states that have decriminalized it or legalized it, are these just micro steps to getting to the ultimate, uh, essentially that it's, it's sort of, it's not if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen? I think we are sort of reaching that tipping point where it's starting to become, I think, a question of, you know, when and not if. Unless this trend really significantly reverses, the fact of the matter is we're going to have 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 states with recreational marijuana laws uh, by, you know, uh, 5, 10 years from now. And when that happens, the reality is the federal laws got to change. It's just not tenable, regardless of what you think about marijuana legalization itself. Even if you're against it, it's not tenable to have this state-federal conflict. It needs to be resolved. All right. Law Professor Alex Kreit, thanks so much. Thank you. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour, the economics of betting the odds this Super Bowl weekend. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. There's something new on the San Diego waterfront, a collection of large bronze monoliths. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson gives us a look. Mexican artist Rivalino brought the installation back into the public eye after it was off exhibit for two years. Speaking through a translator, the artist says world events prompted him to put the statues back in front of people. Each country suffers different levels of repression or censorship or self-censorship. And depending on where and when it is being shown, it makes you think of those different topics. And one thing the artist says about this installation is it deals with very contemporary issues. Rivalino says every nation has to deal with issues tied to freedom of expression. The ten imposing statues now stand in the park next to Tuna Harbor in downtown San Diego. There's a braille box off to the side that lets those with poor vision feel the sculpture. Rafael Castellanos is a commissioner with the Port of San Diego. He says they welcomed the Mexican government's request to display the work here. An art installation of uh, worldwide significance with real content is really important because it's something for people to learn about, get excited about, and come down and really draw more people down to the Tidelands. Five million people have seen this installation as it was on display around the world. This is the first time it's been on exhibit in the United States. It will stay in place until March. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. <laughs> How about a little opera for lunch? Today, the San Diego Opera hosted a free lunchtime concert at the Community Concourse downtown. It's a thank you to the community for supporting the opera during its financial troubles last year. This is their first free lunch concert in more than a decade. We didn't realize it had been such a long time, but yeah, I, I was thinking, oh, eight, ten. Now, we looked it up this morning. It's been 12 years since we've done this program. You won't have to wait another 12 years to catch some culture on your lunch hour. The opera is doing two more noon performances at the Community Concourse on February 19th and again on March 19th. The story of the Cherokee freedmen goes back to the Civil War era when five Native American nations owned more than 10,000 African slaves. Many children were produced from intermarriage and by virtue of their lineage were guaranteed tribal rights. But efforts to strip Cherokee freedmen of their rights has created a legal tug of war. We're not kicking them out because of their color. We're kicking them out because they don't have Cherokee blood. And that's the way it should be. I consider myself to be a Cherokee. Yeah. Yes. And that's what I am. And, and that's, that's what I'll be till I die. Nobody can take that away from us. By Blood is the documentary screening at the San Diego Black Film Festival. The festival's director, Karen Willis, says they felt there would be a lot of synergy considering the gaming industry and the large number of tribal nations in San Diego County. We understand we granted your, your ancestors' rights to be us, but we've decided that you have to be Indian by blood. And so that's the fight. And so it's sort of a tantamount to when the slaves were freed in America, right? And then the U.S. government 
said, okay, you're citizens now. And then 100 years later, this government said, oh, no, you're no longer citizens. Indian gaming generates $30 billion a year in revenue. The black members of those tribes have been generally excluded from those benefits. But we are going to stand, and we are going to stand. It's like how the Jericho wall came down in the Bible. This wall is getting ready to come down. Enough is enough. It is time for us to stand up as black freemen and, and, and say what's on our mind and have no fear. By Blood will make its West Coast premiere tonight during the opening of the San Diego Black Film Festival. The festival features more than 100 films and runs through Sunday at Reading Cinemas in the Gas Lamp Quarter downtown. You might have felt some raindrops today, and you might again tomorrow. Slight chance of showers in the forecast. Coastal temperatures mostly in the 60s to 70s. Sunny and warmer by Sunday. Low 70s for the inland valleys. 50s in the mountains for the next few days, and for the desert, upper 60s to low 70s. Tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.